Ladies and gentlemen, please grab your coffee and take your seats. The Uniting Women in Cyber Summit starts now. Restructuring policy and governance is only one piece of the puzzle. We continue to drive hard along each of our other acquisition lines of effort, contracting at speed of relevance, strengthening and securing our defense industrial base, and effectively training our acquisition workforce. When I was 19 and enlisted in the Army, there's a lot more leadership opportunities earlier in your career if you are committed and you're, uh, in, and you're interested in that. Imagine the supply chain without technology today. I think it's an even bigger question. Imagine it without the cloud today, right? Because the cloud really showed the power that we all knew that it could have and it served its purpose. Reality is, you know, the national defense strategy, national military strategy, national security strategy, they all turn on the United States' ability to out-innovate our adversaries. Ladies and gentlemen, please welcome to the stage your event hosts, Mary Beth Borgwain, President and Co-Founder of the Cyber Guild, and Elizabeth Jimenez, Program Director of Uniting Women in Cyber and Co-Founder of the Cyber Guild. Hey, good afternoon, everyone. This is so exciting, Mary Beth. We're back after a year. I know, it's amazing. It seems like just a couple months ago, Elizabeth, that we were doing this uh, at, with our partner at FedPUPS and uh, we pulled it off during the pandemic It's short in a short order. In a short order. And can I tell you, I feel like we really did good this year. I mean, we have such a stellar lineup. I'm so excited. Do you wanna say a couple words about what we're kind of focusing on this year? I just wanna make sure everybody in the audience is psyched and pumped for these speakers today. Sure, Elizabeth, thank you. So as you know, there isn't uh, a day that doesn't go by that we don't have a headline about cybersecurity, but cybersecurity has really deepened into the private public partnership and into the small medium enterprise to a point where it's not a question of it being a headline anymore. It's, it's critical, it's important, and we're here to educate, inform you all, and actually bring diversity into cybersecurity. And uh, Debbie Salas, who's our new executive director, will give you a lot about the Cyber Guild's mission and purpose. Elizabeth and her team has done a fantastic job of bringing those topics to light with rock stars from cybersecurity, government, and the private sector. But this is really important for all of you. So please chat it up with our speakers. Please meet our sponsors. They want to hear from you because cybersecurity is something that affects all of us. And so we're here again this year, this is year number four, to bring more and more great, great content speakers, con collaboration, networking, chat it up, and we'll be back to you with prizes and trivia. And Elizabeth has a lot of fun in store for you. I'm so excited that you mentioned that, Deb uh, Mary Beth. I know Debbie's coming up to say hi in a second, but we want the audience to really know Please chat away, ask your questions. Our speakers are ready to answer your questions. So please feel free to drop your questions in the chat box. Um, we do have trivia, as Mary Beth mentioned. So this is exciting. We have prizes. Um, you'll just have to play and see. And I will tell you that I had a hand in selecting the questions. So they're going to be very good. Uh, back to you, Mary Beth. Well, thank you, Elizabeth. So I think with that, I would love to bring Debbie Salas on stage. She is our new executive director but she has deep, deep experience in um, the aerospace and defense space. And she's a human capital expert and also a strategist at heart and really makes things happen. So she has been really, really important to the Cyber Guild, which is our, you know, our home and our umbrella over Uniting Women in Cyber. We're a trade association of 501c6, and we also have a foundation, but I'm gonna let Debbie take it away. So Debbie, thank you for joining us. 
No, thank you, Mary Beth. And thank you everyone for joining us and being a part of this amazing Cyber Guild community. Um, I thought you might be interested to know who else is in the room with you. Um, we all, as part of the pre-event questionnaire, shared what we wanted to get out of the next two days. And also we talked about some of our more positive uh, reflections working through COVID. Um, this is a rich uh, and diverse community that you're a part of. There are people here from across industries, from government, tech, banking, government contracting. Um, there are people from disciplines, whether it's IT, finance, human resources. So a really great diverse network that really reflects what the Cyber Guild seeks to stand for. Um, you said in your questionnaire that you were most looking forward to um, the, the networking that we're going to get over the next two days and also the conversations about the emerging trends, whether they be challenges or opportunities. Interestingly, um, there are a significant number here, about at least 20% of the people joining over the next two days are new to cyber or are interested in looking at what the career opportunities it has to offer. So we all are as a group really value the power of networking. That's very, very clear. And I encourage you to activate your networks, whether it's Twitter or LinkedIn, and share the, the great insights you're gonna have through the course of the next two days and broaden the support network that you have around you. It's also clear from your responses that this is a, a group that's recognizing its own resilience. Uh, the vast majority of responses said how much we have come to rely on the flexibility that remote working has given us through working through COVID and that we have not just a desire, but an expectation that it will continue, continue going forward. Um, we have also forged closer and different relationships with those we live with. And we have used technology to close the difference with those that we see too little of or might have lost touch with. The replies that you gave us also showed that many people for COVID, it has highlighted the silent inequities in some of our communities where how easy and affordable access to technology is actually a key to help with a sense of belonging um, to get access to both practical and emotional support and as a means to work and to actually pursue successful livelihoods. So we had some really great um, answers to the questions. Thank you. And on a lighter note, many of us have discovered or rediscovered the joy of cooking. So Julia Childs and Jamie Oliver from my side of the pond would be very proud of us. Um, and amongst us are three authors, would you believe? So watch this space. You may very well see a colleague from today in a future Cyber Guild event. So United Women in Cyber and the Cyber Guild are all about being there for us all. And I invite you to sit back and listen. And I really encourage you to lean in and engage with what I just know are gonna be phenomenal conversations. So enjoy the next couple of days and back to you, Mary Beth. Thank you, Debbie. And just on the side note, Debbie is a phenomenal cook. So she is <laughs> amazing. <laughs> I'm still learning from her. I have my so moments. With that, I want to introduce a um, amazing, amazing woman who has had a, um, she has a master's degree in chemistry, which we all know is a feat in itself. Um, Ellen Ward, who spent 30 years at Textron, which you all know is a global multi-industry corporation, where she worked in the automotive sector for 11 years, and then 22 years in aerospace and defense, where she was CEO of Textron Systems. Go Ellen. Ellen served as Under Secretary of Defense of Acquisition and Sustainment from August 2017 until 2021, and is now a member of several public boards and private company boards. Ellen is must be in high demand with what we have going on in our economy and our um, private public partnership. So Ellen, it's in with great pleasure, I introduce you to come to the stage and talk with us. Thank you. Good afternoon, Uniting Women in Cyber Summit participants, and thank you to the Cyber Guild, and especially Mary Beth and Elizabeth, the co-founders, for organizing this event and for all of the sponsors making it possible. Today, what I'd like to do is to address how cybersecurity issues are impacting our national security. 
and the actions that DOD has taken to proactively address cyber threats within the acquisition process. My perspective is shaped both from my time in industry as well as in the government. Um, I started out my life as a chemist and worked in the lab developing new products and then moved on to lead teams and introduce new products. And then being in a multi-industry company, I was um, very um really appreciative of the fact that without moving companies, I could move around and work in different sectors. So I moved into aerospace and defense. That led me to working with the Department of Defense and many of our defense industrial based suppliers. And much to my surprise, in 2017, I was invited to take a Senate confirmed position working for the Secretary of Defense. So I recommend one of those Senate confirmation hearings to anyone who's looking for something particularly sporty to do. Um, but I got there and um, what I decided was I needed to first figure out how the place worked and what I wanted to do. I was very, very fortunate to be able to bring along with me some colleagues who decided they would give back to our nation a little bit more and serve as well. And we decided that perhaps the most impactful thing we could do would be to take all of the authorities that Congress had given the Department of Defense to make our acquisition system more flexible, more secure, more um, sort of working at the speed of relevance, if you will, in Secretary Mattis's words. So we started um, in on that. Now, the Office of Acquisition and Sustainment really operates like a corporate office would in industry. So the Office of Secretary of Defense, where ANS is, is part of the corporate DOD entity, with the operating units being the military services, the Army, the Navy, the Air Force, and so forth, along with many agencies. And then instead of having 10 or 12 um, directors on a board of directors, you have almost 550, and they are called Congress. So it makes for quite an interactive experience as you move forward. Uh, what I also learned was that we had a high degree of interface with um, all of our interagency partners, whether that be the National Security Council, Treasury, Commerce, and so forth. So there was a lot to do. My office was responsible and the office is still responsible for all the policies and procedures for acquisition, as well as oversight of the approximate $400 billion a year spend that DOD has on both products and services. So my belief was that our goal was to field capability downrange just as quickly as possible. Yet we had to be sure to maintain technology overmatch versus our adversaries and to be very careful custodians of the taxpayer dollars. So during um, late 2017, we decided that we would take all of these authorities that had been piling up for a few years and rewrite DOD 5000. And what we did was to add a number of acquisition authorities to make things a little bit quicker, to be able to use commercial um, products to a little bit more readily, to not treat software the same way that hardware was um, treated. So we came up with what was called the adaptive acquisition framework. And there were some um, very important um, tenets to think about there. As we were starting this, we were shifting as a nation in terms of our national defense strategy from um, really working with countering violent extremist organizations um, in the Middle East, as everyone well knows particularly, to focusing on the near peer threat, China, Russia, North Korea, Iran. 
And what we saw at the time was there was more and more activity in what we called the gray zone. And the gray zone is basically activity that is beyond open conflict. And in fact, our current um, Deputy Secretary of Defense, Kath Hicks, focused on this in a very in-depth study at CSIS um, before coming to her current role. So the way you can find this, define this, um, if you Google it, is gray zone describes space in between peace and war in which state and non-state actors engage in competition. It is characterized by intense political, economic, international, and military competition, more fervent in nature than normal steady state diplomacy yet short of conventional war. Now, there, what we saw was gray zone activity was beginning to escalate in 2017. Um, and today we now have familiarity by just about everybody with the cyber hacking, um, the ransomware, colonial pipeline, solar winds, and many, many more. In fact, according to Gartner, by 2025, at least 75% of IT organizations will face one or more attacks. Now, in 2017, one of the things my office did was to participate in CFIUS, or Countering Foreign Investment in the United States, which again is an interagency group that really looks at beneficial ownership um, of companies that try to acquire critical technology in the US, whether that be through an acquisition, through joint ventures, or even by purchasing real estate adjacent to um, critical government facilities. And what we did was we really worked to illuminate the supply chain to understand who was the owner behind a lot of these shell organizations. And then we had the authority to block this. Well, that was helpful, but it wasn't sufficient. So what we began to focus on was the fact that we had systems war fighting systems, whether they be platforms, whether they be weapon systems that were har hardware enabled, but software defined. And that software was rapidly being modernized and um, spiraled into the existing hardware platforms. Think F-35, for instance, with all the upgrades that come along. And what this meant was we were more and more subject to attack through all of these um, software updates. We also found that we were moving to the age of digital engineering for many, many different reasons. One, just being transparency so that the department could go into a cloud environment and watch the hardware design or the software coding as it was being done because we had challenges with intellectual property, ownership, what DOD paid for, what they didn't. We also wanted to be able to integrate, to test, to train. Again, more and more happening online, putting more and more of an onus um, on us to make sure that we had resilient cyber defenses. Additionally, we were continuing to get more and more detailed intelligence from the intelligence community with really um, the National Security Agency, NSA, being at the tip of the spear, providing us information, saying how many of our critical systems were actually being compromised. We also, because of cyber attacks, we also saw critical portions of the F-35 and F-22 fighter aircraft all of a sudden being very clearly incorporated into some Chinese fighter aircraft. We began to see counterfeit goods come on the market, um, many electronics. So 
what we decided we needed to do as we were rewriting DOD 5000 was to incorporate cybersecurity features not only into the defense industrial base IT networks, but also into the requirements for the designs of the products and services themselves. So we came up with actual functional requirements that were being rolled out. Now, the challenge with looking at um, defense industrial base or DIB networks and having them upgraded was that it takes time and it takes resources and it can't be done overnight. So what we did was we came up with a system that was analogous to ISO for quality, and we called it CMMC, the Cybersecurity Maturity Model Certification. And what we did is we created five levels of this, because if you are designing and manufacturing military uniforms, you have very different needs um, versus if you are designing and manufacturing satellites, for instance. So in the government, you cannot just put out a requirement overnight and have that legally bind all of the contractors to DOD. Remember, we in fact were taking statute written in the NDAA um, by Congress. We were translating it into policy and then putting up implementation guidance, as it's called at DOD, through procedures. We were developing rules that had to be ratified um, by the Office of Management and Budget um, through a group called ORIRA. All of this takes time to do. But I believe that it's really important to practice new behaviors, to get into the messy middle of it, to see where you are, what the challenges are, how you have to course correct. And I also strongly believe that just self-attestation or basically saying, yes, we comply, is not sufficient. I frankly think back to going to school and remember those teachers that made you pass in your homework versus those that said, just do it and we'll review it in class. Which homework did you do first? So I believe we needed a way to audit, to measure. You can't determine progress unless you measure it. So we began the, progress, uh, the process of putting out rules um, they were put in place last December. There's a 12 month period in which the government has to respond to all the comments. There were over 800 comments and the um, Office of Industrial Policy, the CIO, many others within DOD are working through that now. And industry has gone to great efforts to become compliant with the five different levels as appropriate um, of CMMC. I believe this is a critical capability for DOD and for our defense industrial base. Now we have a challenge because um, the majority of the true innovation in this country, and it takes innovation to maintain overmatch um, against our adversaries, 80% at least of the true innovation comes from small companies. And what we don't want to do is disadvantage those small companies in a way that they cannot afford to be compliant with CMMC. We don't want to drive overhead rates so high that no longer um, are they financially competitive. So the onus really is on DOD and the community of crimes to find a way to allow the smalls to become compliant. And I believe a large portion of that is DOD giving access to cloud environments with the correct security, with the automatic authorities to operate if you use their stacks, to allow these small businesses to be compliant with CMMC. But we have to get in the midst of it. We have to practice that. We need to keep going. So um, the new um, 
acquisition policy continues to reach out and see what's happening within the industrial base. And a key partner for that are our industrial associations. And I so strongly urge those of you in government, as well of the, as those of you in industry, to make really, really high use of, you know, the National Defense Industrial Association, um, AIA, PSC, many others that are out there, because that's the way your voices can really be heard. And DOD cannot respond to each individual company, yet it's quite compelling if an industry association comes with, you know, 10, 20, 30, 40, 50 CEOs signing a letter. So the other part of what we looked at in the acquisition policy was to make sure that there are requirements for cyber hardening the actual war fighting systems as they were being developed. So this was in close concert with the joint staff who has responsibility for requirements to make sure we understand best practices to get there. So it all is coming together, but it's going to take the community working together to figure out how we really transcend these problems. And it cannot be just DOD with their finger on the transmit button, nor can it be industry just with their finger on the transmit button. It has to be a lot of transmittal and receipt and working the hard problems to understand how we develop an, an ecosystem that allows us to continue to evolve with a very, very resilient, not only backroom practices, engineering practices, um, but also to make sure we end up with systems that are cyber resilient. And I believe digital engineering is going to be a key to all of this. But there is an activation energy to overcome, if you will, to get there. And I believe that every industry partner out there needs to have in their strategic plan how they migrate to digital engineering. I know that every audit committee out there, particularly in public companies, but also in private companies, um, is trying to understand how they have a supply chain um, that is resilient, that will continue to to deliver, to allow um, each company to supply DOD at the right time with um, the correct functionality in their systems. And right now, cybersecurity threats are frankly one of the highest risks that industry in this country has. And that's a challenge because our defense industrial base is really the nexus of both our national security as well as our economic security. So if um, there are any questions, I am looking here at the chat and I invite you to tell me what's working, what's not working, what we can do to continue the discussion and make sure that we have the talent in the pipeline, we have the procedures, and we have the products that really demonstrate capability. Okay, so the first one I'm looking at here is how much responsibility and effort do primes need to take on to make sure there are hundreds or thousands of suppliers are practicing proper cyber hygiene? Okay, this brings out the point that we typically don't have so many problems in the first or second layer of our supply chain, but typically the supply chain goes down six, seven, eight layers. And frankly, contractually, the primes have responsibility for their suppliers. Now, the whole issue of contract privity gets in the way of this because they don't always know who those suppliers are. And what's particularly problematical is if the same supplier of even a 50 cent diode is supplying 
multiple programs in the same company five layers down and something happens to that facility and compromises it, then it compromises so many. So the short answer is the primes have an enormous amount of responsibility and I have seen them leaning forward um, to help their supply chains. They can translate these rules and regulations. They can have working sessions. They can also compel the industry associations to do the same and reach out to really have working groups for best practices to find what are those cloud environments with the least friction to get into that will give us maximum security. Okay, there's another one here. Do you see any changes with the current CMMC regulations coming out, specifically for CMMC level one? Well, right now, everything is under consideration. Um, it's all pre-decisional, but DOD is coming out shortly. In fact, the DASD for Industrial Policy, Jesse Salazar, who I met with yesterday, told me they are coming out shortly um, with their take on CMMC. I believe um, time is right for what I call CMMC 2.0, that we learn as we go along. We need to course correct, and we need this to work for every everyone and we're really we're in the messy middle right now so we don't want perfect to be the enemy of good enough we need to get out there but i um because i'm no longer within dod i'm not privy to what decisions are being made but i know that dod will be communicating and i urge all of you to use your voices you know it's a powerful thing if um, a number of companies get together um, and write the Secretary of Defense a letter asking questions, voicing concerns. That letter will go to the Executive Secretary um, for the um, Secretary of Defense, and it will get tasked out to be answered. And it has to be answered, um, might not be really quickly, but it will be answered, and it all goes into the record. So your voice needs to be heard with concerns. Speak up. Okay. So I think that's about it, unless there's any more questions coming along, but okay, here we go. Could you see an expansion upon the concept of CMMC to address supply chain risk management or the distinct problems of cybersecurity for manufacturing? And I think it says OT, I think they mean operational tests there. Um, frankly, I think CMMC is trying to encompass all of that. Now, from a manufacturing point of view, one of the largest concerns in terms of cyber hacking is with all of the automated industrial controls we have today, someone hacking in and taking over plants, very similar to having um, smart systems in your home to handle the heat, the lights, um, and so forth and so on. But it is meant to be a comprehensive system, and we're learning as we go. I feel strongly that we need to build on what we have in place versus taking a clean sheet of paper because time is not on our side. Um, the adversary has a vote. And right now we need to come together as industry, as government and come up with solutions and continue to evolve those solutions to try to make them better and better. All right, so one more last question I will take right here. How do we get recent grads of cyber programs the required experience to join the workforce? Excellent question. I am a huge proponent of um, doing internships with DOD, internships with industry. We actually started quite a few of those um, when I was within DOD, but you know, Volunteer your time if that's all you can do. Even a week is better than nothing. Again, I would reach out to the industry associations, particularly NDIA is very, very involved in this, the National Defense Industrial Association. Um, there's a great women in defense group there. Rachel McCaffrey um, runs it. And um, I know that Rachel would love to hear from you. So with that, I am going to wrap up and thank you again for all of your time. And Elizabeth, I'm gonna hand back to you.